After a year of quarantines and lockdowns due to COVID, it might seem like we've all become experts in isolation. That was a difficult but necessary situation to prevent exposure to a virus. And in electronics, we use isolation to keep our devices and users safe because it turns out exposure to high voltage and current is also bad for us. So isolation is necessary, but it doesn't need to be difficult. And Bill Slattery from Analog Devices is with us today to talk about the growing importance of proper isolation. Welcome to Tech Chats, Bill. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much and for that warm, safe introduction. Yeah. So what's driving all the activity and discussion around isolation lately? Yeah, I suppose there's a confluence of two things that are that's happening here. Firstly, is the industries that uh, are growing most, especially from a semiconductor perspective, are ones that are increasingly in need of this safety technology. And, and as you refer to, um, it's not dissimilar to what we're doing in the human world, where we're keeping ourselves apart, but yet together in this isolated COVID world. And I suppose there's, there's three big markets we see driving this need to put this electronic safety and embed it into our electronics. But the first one is, is, I suppose, smart factories or Industry 4.0. So think of it in the past, these were big analog communication type 4 to 20 milliamp systems. Now we're digitalizing everything. And I suppose specifically, you know, a lot of these communication formats that are being used in factories are, are ones that we well understand, like RS-232, RS-485, CAN, USB. But these have all come out of the PC world, where if something goes wrong or the data gets corrupted, you know, hey, we can, we can put up with a blue screen. But a factory, you can't just reboot the factory. The idea of the eye coupler and isolation technology is that it helps make sure that that data is protected, that the integrity of it from one end of the system to the other is kept intact. In healthcare, at a first level, it's easy to understand why you need uh, safety, a safety barrier. And this is the case of, you, you know, we obviously have to protect the patients. But in addition, a lot of the electronics in these systems is quite sophisticated and 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 us humans can can damage it. We all know about ESD, but there's far more things occurring that can potentially cause electronic systems to be damaged. And again, the eye coupler isolation is key in these systems to keep patients always walking and equipment always working. And the final big market, you know, we all know about the e-mobility. Instead of having a 500 horsepower engine on it, it has got 50, 100 kilowatts of power under the bonnet, electrical power. That stuff. We need to protect humans from, from touching it and getting electrocuted, but also, again, protect the electronics in these systems. A lot of the, the associated infrastructure, you know, charging stations, um, you know, kids will be plugging in chargers into cars in the next not too distant future. We have to make sure that they're kept safe. We are also seeing solar inverters. A lot of this technology is kind of similar. It has the same functionality and it has the same needs for safety and data robustness. But more and more power electronics, especially with the evolution or you know emergence of wide band gap devices and these markets, we're seeing a renaissance, if you like, in power electronics that mixed with very sensitive, you know, low voltage circuits is prime use case for isolators. So we see this confluence of both the markets and this emergence of higher voltages and more sensitive electronic devices, you know, driving this inherent need to have isolation barriers everywhere in systems. Obviously, we're talking about very different markets, and I imagine there are different requirements for isolation for each of those. The interesting thing is a lot of the requirements on the safety are, are quite similar. You know, the basic building block is what we call and define the digital isolator. So th this would be, you know, the replacement for what was an optocoupler. So on either side of that, then, if you think of that as the basic building block, you know, in parallel, and this probably more dovetails into the markets, the two big areas where we integrate this function at a higher level would be in isolated gate drivers driven by the energy markets and electrification of transportation we talked about, and just the general connectivity ones. And this would be, you know, industry 4.0 and smart factories, as well as digital healthcare. So the, the isolated gate driver is a specific case where you know high performance gate drivers are linked with the isolation barrier in one device. And again, you know there's significant innovation here at the product level, at the system level, and at the market level. And on the right hand side, in that green area, the isolated connectivity. This is driven by this digitalization of factory technology. So gone are the days of four to twenty milliamps in new factories where we've got cobots and advanced monitoring systems. 
So again, the need to connect all these from one end of the factory to the other in a safe, secure way is seeing, firstly, the re-emergence of all these old standards we were well used to in the PC world, like RS-485 and CAN to some extent, USB. But obviously adding this layer internally, what I call it the pixie dust of iCoupler isolation, adds that robustness to those well understood and you know well-known standards of digital communication, something that's vital in these factory applications that need to operate reliably, continuously, and without fail. And in terms of being reliable and operating without fail, you know a thing or two about it because you've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as, as I look at the history of it, I think Analog was the first company, and maybe I should use the word probably, uh, the, the first company to do a full digital isolator in, in a semiconductor form. Um, and that was 20 years ago, so 2000 and one, we introduced our first iCoupler digital isolator part. And since then, we've continued to innovate along the axis of both performance and you know adding more channels, doing higher speed. So our objective is to try and build these solutions to take out the hassle of figuring out how safety should be done by our customers. So let them innovate at the level that they're doing, whether it's building the next great traction inverter for an electric car to a, the newest type of diagnostic system. And, and I think for us, what we're really proud of is the fact that we've shipped three point, almost 4 billion channels of isolation we've shipped in, the, in that 20 years. And we've had zero failures to the, of that isolation barrier. Fundamentally, we've got this safety and robustness capability that's second to none. So what are some of the considerations that go into picking the right isolator? Uh, you know, the first thing that, that obviously you think of when you're using isolation is, well, what voltages am I trying to stand off and how many channels do I need? And as the basic building block, I think we've got one of the broadest portfolios of such parts from three kilovolt RMS ratings up to five and indeed going beyond that to seven and a half kV. All of these have surge protection up to 20 kV. What's emerging now also is a need for higher working voltages. You know, battery stacks are moving up towards 800 volts. String inverters in solar are moving to 1,500 volts. Uh, and of course, we've recently launched our second generation of this family, the ADU M1XX and 2XX, and they have significantly improved EMC performance. Of course, I would always say that they're aggressively priced, and we've added uh, capability on, on higher working voltages. But again, I think the main point here is, again, simple devices, but perform at a very high level. And we've got options for all different scenarios. We've talked about the why and the what. Let's talk about how these actually work. We've used inductive type technology to create that isolated barrier. So we use a combination of coils and polyimide insulation. We use this advanced coil technology that we overlay on top of standard CMOS processes. Uh, we use various types of modulation schemes to get the data across the barrier. And again, we package these in a, a number of different types of small, medium, and larger type packages at different voltages and at different speeds. Uh, but we continue to innovate, drive up speed, higher voltages. And you know, I think the key ones that we've done in recent times into our newest generation is improved the common mode transient immunity much lower EMI, you know, we've increased by more than a factor of two, the EMI envelope for the part. Faster speeds, who doesn't want more speed? And of course, as a basic building block, we've kept these pin compatible to what we've already had. So it allows people to use newer, better parts that actually tend to have better pricing than the older generations. Now, we've talked about data isolation, but you can also provide isolated power as well, right? So isolating power is a little bit more challenging. In fact, it's a lot more challenging. You know, we do this again using our, our embedded transformer technology. And we have a family of both standalone parts that are shown here that get that power across. Typically, you, you were talking about 300 milliwatts to 500 milliwatt type systems. The objective is to try and get the efficiency as good as possible. But also, I think one of the key things about the, the ADUM 5028 and 6028 is that they're the tiniest isolated power devices on the planet. So if you are doing an isolated design and you need power separate from the rest of the signal chain, this is an ideal solution if you're at that power level. What we've also done here is, uh, you'll see on the next slide, is where we integrate both the power and the data into one 
device because obviously, obviously if you're sending data across wires or systems or a PCB board, power is going to be sitting beside it. So we have a family of integrated parts, the ADU M642X family, it's our latest family. And I think one of the key things we've done here and the most important ones by moving to our 28 lead wide body package from our 16 lead, we've been able to enable a scenario where you won't need stitching capacitance. You won't need a four layer board to meet class B CISPR 32 standard. So that to us is one of the significant things about our latest integrated power and data isolators. So I think that's that's the kind of summary on the basic building blocks of isolated signals, data and power that we've got this number one market position in and we believe the best technology out there. The next slide here shows this alphabet soup of standards that we all know and love. And this is a kind of a quick cheat sheet that'll allow you quickly decide what matches with your design. You know, if you choose whatever format of communication you need, well, do I need to have isolated power? In fact, do I need isolation at all? Do I need fault protection? And I think the next slide, you know, I think visually shows this and it gives a good example for all standards, if you like. Now, this this one here talks about our newest ADM 2867 isolated RS485 with everything. First thing in, in that blue area in the diagram, you see the basic building block of isolated data channels. In this case, there's four channels here. In the green area above it, you'll see the isolated power. And finally, I suppose, is the, um, the purple piece is the protocol format, or in this case, it's the RS485 transceiver. But even within the transceiver, there's a number of additional functions and features we, we've added in. If you, if you think of isolation is about safety and keeping things isolated and are coupled together without problems, you know, we've also innovated those functions into the transceiver protocol. And I think some of the examples here, you'll see like the cable invert function, for example. Apparently, this is one of the bigger challenges in, in many systems. People plug in the cables the wrong way around. In, in using this part, we will we, we'll detect that and adjust for it accordingly. And of course, we've also moved up on speed. The transceiver speeds are, are the, the highest that these standards are capable of driving today. The other interesting point to note here is that this is the first to market with a 1500 volt DC operating voltage level. So remember, this is not the standoff voltage, but it's the continuous operation of the system in a 1500 volt environment. So you've got some of the pins here with 1500 volts on them. And, and again, I think the other point to note here, when I show RS485 here, this is an example of all the other standards have the same format where you have the power and the data, and then you have the specific protocol format um, communication or interface capability. You mentioned the cable inversion function, but let's talk about that and some of the other benefits you've built into your isolators. Yeah, so, so kind of delving in a little bit more detail under, under the hood and not too much. I, I don't want to be, you know, I, I do want to whet the appetite here. I don't want to kind of give too much, too much detail. But the idea here is that I isolate RS485, some of the notable differences to what's out there as standard type of products, you know, in terms of functionality, the cable inversion function, you know, that is a big issue in these, you know, hardware. You know, remember, it's not a plug normally that's used to connect in a factory, your RS485. It's often a kind of a block that's sh shown here. So it's quite typical that the wires can get connected the wrong way around. But in this case, you don't have to worry about that. That's all dealt with. Noise immunity and CMTI, we do see our CMTI level going to up to 250 kilovolts per microsecond. And again, I think this is industry leading and it is inherent to the type of isolation technology we use and the polyimide insulation levels. And we've done many tests at very high speeds and found really robust transmission performance of the data. And again, as I said earlier, the key thing here is, is do no harm to the data. Data comes in on one side, we just want to pass it through and not have it corrupted and have it wrong at the other end. You know, the other thing, it's, it's quite interesting here that as, as we move towards smaller geometry, lower voltage systems, supporting higher voltage is still important in a lot of applications and gives a better noise margin, but it's also still required. So not only will people want to work with 3.3 volt capability, they'll still want 5 volts, but, you know, hybrid 5 and 3.3 and full 5 volts across both sides. So that, that gives a kind of a quick view of how we take this technology and capability and apply it in a real, if you like, in this case, interface RS-485 interface system. 
You pointed out that 480 megabits per second is well within your capability, but let's take that a step further and talk about your gigabit isolators. Yeah, so I kind of I think we're, we're pretty proud of the fact that we were the first to come out with a, um, a gigabit isolator, um, our ADN4654 family um, released last year, the year before, it's well in production now. So these are the first parts that can go beyond that one gigabit per second barrier. And again, we see these used in everything from instrumentation, medical equipment. LVDIS is, is an important protocol that's used for these. A lot of systems today that, that are operating at very high speed tend to use short-run fiber uh, links as for galvanic isolation. So we see this one, the gigabit isolator family being able to actively replace and supplant the, the need to use a, a fiber optic link. And it's not the fiber optic link is bad. It's great for isolation, but it tends to be big, bulky, and expensive. So we we, we see the the, 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 um, the gigabit isolation initially getting get great traction in any of these medical applications, imaging applications that tend to obviously also be used in, in medical. And as well as uh, the, the, our first generation of you know one gigabit, we, we're actually, this year, we will launch a two and a half gig version. So keep your eyes open for that. Uh, and again, one of the things that we see here is that um, while our one gigabit is used today, people for very high speed systems, if you're driving a 4K or 8K monitor, tend to parallel up the data isolators to get the total bandwidth. But obviously, if you can, on the diagram on the left, you can see two 4654s, but ultimately you could have that into one. And this may also allow you to hook up to simple FPGAs where you can run at very high speed over a single lane rather than have multi lanes, if you can serialize that and run at very high speed as our isolators and this next generation of isolators will enable, we feel that this is this is really the next dislocation in at least our technology of, of isolation where we can bring this to speeds way beyond what's there today. And, and again, we're already seeing it used in in HDMI systems of isolate, where you need isolated video and isolated communication transceivers with FPGAs. Now to switch gears, let's talk about isolated gate drivers where we're dealing with much different voltage and current levels than we've touched on so far. The electrification of everything. I mean, you could argue that we've had electrification for a long number of years, but it's now coming into, into our lives in a completely different way. It, designers, semiconductor and system electronic designers are having to deal with powers in the kilowatt range that they never had to think about before. And we've already seen things like wide, wide band gap devices reshape what it is we can do with power electronics. So we see this as a revolutionary material, revolutionary devices. And our play in it is to be the responsible adult in the room for these um, precocious, new, really capable child prodigies that are silicon carbide so the gate drivers and the and it's not just that the fact it's not just an isolated gate driver and if you look at the range of products we have here you know it, it goes from pure performance which is about speed essentially in low low delay high cmti to fully programmable devices that really take in a number of capabilities like under voltage lockout or other thermal monitoring activities that make sure you can protect the, the high power systems before damage is done. So we see our role here with, with these wide band gap devices. It's, it's not just about driving the device, it's driving it safely. It's looking after a number of safety housekeeping activities and it's giving the choice of, are you really going after performance or do you want all the capability done in, in the devices? And again, we have a series of parts we've released recently and we'll continue to add to this portfolio. And I think it, it is worth noting that, um, you know, Wolfspeed are one of the leaders here in the silicon carbide technologies. And, you know, we're working very hand in glove almost with them. You know, they have a particular capability that we do not have, but we have a capability that they don't have. And we work jointly in terms of obviously creating the capability, technical capability to, it, to, to make this technology more mainstream. And we provide a number of tools, evaluation boards, test reports to make the design process simpler, easier, and enjoyable. But I think that the main point here is that we see Wolfspeed as one of the leaders here. 
we're the leaders in isolation technology and indeed at a broader level in terms of signal mixed signal processing technologies and we think it's a it's a great collaboration as we help together to drive this revolution that we're seeing coming around the bend with electric cars and your home that has the capability to not only have your your your, your house powered by solar panels but using that electronics the inverters there as chargers so the requirement obviously for safety is pretty well understood given the high voltages but it also a lot of the other functions to optimize and get the most out of this technology and again it is about making the technology robust safe but also affordable so that we can all drive safely into a sustainable and long future Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Once again, that's Bill Slattery from Analog Devices. If you'd like to learn more about ADI's interface and isolation technology, click the links in the description or visit mauser.com. And be sure to check back soon for the next episode of Tech Chats. Mm-hmm.